afternoon, everybody. We are back again with the Startup Podium. This is Muthu, founder of Ribozone and the curator for the Startup Podium program. Along with <coughs> my co-founder, Pujita Jane, is also there. Um, she's also there, but she's not going to be speaking this afternoon. So I'm doing the session. We have a very action-packed panel, great, great panel. They're from Europe, from India, from Singapore, from all over the place. So some are very early in the morning, some are late in the day, but they're here to share their knowledge in the area of blockchain, AI, and cloud computing. Our first person in the spotlight is going to be my friend. She's coming in from Paris this morning, Le Leah Dias, founder of QuasiFat. I'm going to not short sell her, I'm going to let her introduce herself and then do her presentation. And then I will introduce Vikash, uh, Adrian, and Daniel in that not in that sequence, but I will introduce one by one as they go. So Leah, over to you to start the panel, uh, your spotlight, and then I will go to the others after that. Right. Uh, thanks very much, Mutu, um, and thanks for having me here at Medica. It's uh, a real joy to be um, presenting here on this spotlight uh, with a great, uh, great other speakers as well. So just a little bit about me. I'm uh, a pharmacist by background. I'm from Australia. I'm currently incubated with my startup in Paris and have been for the last couple of years. And basically, I started my career as a pharmacist and about five or six years I got into digital uh, technology which was looking at the electronic health records and robotic systems to improve patient care and this got me really understanding sort of the the challenges that we had in the healthcare system so that then moved me into looking at blockchain and and other technologies um, to improve patient health care and we are particularly at Choir Factor looking at how to empower patients by giving them back control of their data via blockchain, um, via a blockchain-based platform in the form of a patient health record. So today I'm going to talk to a little bit about the challenges um, we, we've seen that, that have come up. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, okay, so how has this pandemic... Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, so how has the pandemic changed um, healthcare this year for us uh, during this time of the pandemic? Uh, so we'll, we'll talk a bit about this today. So healthcare 2020, so we've experienced probably one of the biggest uh, events, unprecedented events this year, uh, COVID-19, which is our Black Swan event. And we have seen many people working tirelessly, being healthcare professionals, which is pretty close to my heart, being a, a pharmacist and working in emergency departments and ICUs in the past. And so it's been quite um, gripping for us all to see where this, this event has taken us. And I'd, I'd seen things like SARS and H1N1 in my career um, but nothing as uh, devastating as, as this pandemic has been. But we have got a bit of good news and there's, there's uh, a vaccine on its way. So, so we know that that's in action. So let's talk a little bit more about the global health crisis as we know it, uh, COVID-19 that existed, resulting in global outbreaks and preventable diseases and deaths. There's been a, a sure sign of privacy concerns, um, the lack of trust for things like tracing apps and also that leading into health data storage as well. I think the health data storage has been a problem for a, a few years now, but uh, it's come into the spotlight a, more, about a bit more. And it's something that Choir Factor has been focused on and, and looking at as well during this time. Uh, supply chain disruptions, uh, which have led to counterfeiting and li limited supply chain visibility. And we'll talk a little bit more about this because this is an area as well we've been, been looking at for two years and uh, is, is quite a significant area as we come about looking at uh, vaccination distribution throughout the world. And finally, uh, it's identifying high-risk patients for vaccine distribution and proof of administration as well. So this is the next thing that we're looking at and how this is done more efficiently with all the knowledge that we have obtained over the year. And things are moving really quickly in this area. So, so it's good to see all the innovative ideas that have come out of this. So let's uh, focus a little bit more on the privacy concerns. As I said before, uh, patients are, are thinking about how should I don't download this uh, contact tracing app? How is my data gonna be collected and stored? Who's accessing it? 
and I need my data. So, so these are real questions that we have around privacy and I really think it's something we need to explore more into the future about how we, we're storing this data and using it. Talk about disruptions around supply chains. And so I'll give you a little bit of an example of this because it's something that I've known this logistics around uh, supply chains quite well. Uh, supply chains are complex and they're orientated around uh, just-in-time manufacturing and logistics. They focus more on efficiency rather than robustness. And in this case, you can see uh, a manufacturer, shippers, truckers, many parties involved. And the crisis has really shown the vulnerability and the weaknesses of our modern supply chains and also how limited visibility on the products as they trans transit through these supply chains. <clears throat> So what happens when parties drop off in the case of pandemic, when uh, manufacturing plants get shut down in Wuhan, for example, or, or uh, different parties have to, to uh, bow out of the process, you can see that there's major disruptions and the chain falls apart. There's a lack of transparency and visibility across the different uh, truckers and, and shippers and so on. And companies now have to focus on the urgent supply of medication, life-saving medication and products. But uh, we know that, that that has been steeped with, with its own problems. Uh, we also rely a lot on manual processes during this process, uh, rather than having efficient processes in place, as I mentioned before. And it, because it relies on a lot of human beings, when you take them out of the equation, the whole thing tends to fall apart. So what happens when an already fragile supply chain falls apart? Well, things go missing. There's elect illicit activities. There's, uh, you know, fake medications that enter the market, uh, medications that are of bad quality, and uh, there's a lot of inactivity, that, uh, illicit activity that goes on here. So this is not a new problem for Quar Factor. We've been looking at this over the last couple of years and we, we discovered it was a $200 billion industry of medication fraud, particularly in developing countries where one in 10 medications are fake. And this has created um, over a million people dying in, um, in Southeast Asia and Africa and Latin America as well through fake or bad quality medications. Uh, there have been regulations that have been put into place that look at uh, things like falsified medicines directive, which came in 2019. There's been the HIPAA that came in many years earlier and, and the GDPR around privacy as well. So there have been attempts to try to regulate the industry. Um, uh, however, with this, it's inconsistent throughout, those regulations are inconsistent throughout the world. So you have found that in different countries don't observe these same regulations as well. So we looked at uh, how we would contribute to, to helping this and we did a, a project in April of 2019 tracking uh, medication distribution across the supply chain. We had uh, we encountered a lot of uh, issues during this time, for example, uh, cancellation of flights, so we had to look at shipping, but in the end we were able to uh, hash the, the medications and, and um, timestamp them when they entered into the into the country. So that was Venezuela and distributed to the different healthcare facilities there. So let's look at healthcare 2025 and what's happening now. We uh, look into uh, technologies like blockchain, AI and cloud chain technologies to support activities. Uh, and I think we, we, I won't go into all the, the um, attributes of blockchain, but we know it's a decentralized database. There's cryptography, immutability, transparency, and smart contracts that, that are uh, part of this uh, technology. Um, but I'll focus more now on the use cases of what I've seen happening in the industry. And I think that this is particularly interesting for, for many people uh, just coming into who, who don't know uh, what is happening in this space. So basically this uh, pharma and medical devices supply chain traceability that I mentioned before. There's also the medical records and interoperability. And I'll talk a bit, a bit more about this because this is where we're moving towards now. But this is about how we develop more of a patient centric care as well. And this is, we're, we're relying again on paper records, um, bespoke, um, outdated systems, and also in many, many forms, paper as well. So we really need to look at ways how we manage that. 
Digital identity. So this is about uh, one in five patients being mismatched with their medical information when they come into the, the hospital, and that may be the same hospital. When they reach a different hospital, for example, about 50% of patients are mismatched. So how do we get their identity consistent with their medical records? Uh, clinical trials and genomic data sequencing are two other use cases that we've seen um, very effectively using this technology. So, uh, and this results in patient safety, better quality of patient care, decreased costs and efficient operations. So what are we doing now? So what we are doing is we're leveraging blockchain and AI to improve global vaccination coverage. We're empowering patients by giving them access to vaccination doses and uh, proof of vaccination. So the distribution process, we're not actually distrib um, uh, involved in the distribution, but we're monitoring that activity. Uh, securing and streamlining uh, global su vaccination supply and that's also connecting patients with their healthcare providers for monitoring and follow-up. And I think this is really important that we, and, and we've seen this with medical virtual consultations, how this has been adopted and embraced during this time of COVID-19. So we really need to leverage that, all of that work that's been done in this space. Uh, what, what is Qua Factor? We are a blockchain chain-based company that does smart contracts for a personal health record platform. We're a monitoring system, a privacy platform, and we rely on, um, we, we use uh, AI-driven technology for triggering alerts and medication refills. Our, our technology is patient-centric. So as I mentioned before, we empower patients by giving them control of their data. Um, this means democratising the health data, so adopting a more patient-centric approach where patients can own their medication in one complete personalised health record, which is owned by the patient. And this is, uh, as we discovered, like there's a lot of unnecessarily duplicate tests, medication errors and misdiagnosis, and particularly working in an emergency department as a pharmacist um, many years ago, I came across this. It would take me about two to three hours to sometimes do a medication reconciliation for patients. And you couldn't even, uh, you could recognise that sometimes in that case, those medications weren't right. So patients would go through their hospital admission through to discharge with potentially the wrong history recorded. So finding a different way to do this and having the patient at the centre of that care becomes um, a real point. And when the vaccination comes in, well, boom, you know, the patient can have that information stored on their, their personal device. What are others doing? Well, strengthening supply chains and restoring trust. So just looking at other activities by the World Health Forum, looking to digitalize and move away from paper, data privacy for suppliers and um, provide incentives and start now. The US House of Representatives are also doing their national stock, uh, stockpiling. And this was due to the many problems around the supply chain. And they're investing about 50 million into this over 21 and 22. And then we've got MediLedger there. And so they're looking at, uh, they've got about 90, over 90% 90 of their products that are able to be verified on that supply chain. Um, back to the, the uh, fragile supply chain and just looking at the uh, people that are involved in that, including manufacturers, logistics, hospitals, having a digital uh, distributed ledger encrypted, and then having that shared with all the different parties there in the decentralized ledger. Uh, just for the interest of time, um, just quickly onto contact tracing and advanced cryptography methods that are used in that, and our qua factor patient centric technology there. So we, we try to get that information staying with the patient there. And finally, just to say uh, international COVID 19 vaccination certificates, there's a collaboration between six Swiss SIGPA. Uh, guard time KS1 um, time stamping, which came out of Estonia and the World Health Organization, and they, they're bringing out a time stamp proof vaccination or a vaccination certificate, which um, protects personalized data as well. So really moving towards personalized medicine and preventive medicine, and these are the real uh, benefits of the, the technologies that I'm working with at the moment, including blockchain, AI, digital therapeutics. So thank you for your time.
Thank you for the presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Our next one online is my friend from Singapore, Dr. Daniel Tay. He's a consultant vitro retinal surgeon in the Singapore National Eye Center, and he's also head of AI and digital innovation in Singapore Eye Research Institution. Um, Daniel, just uh, add on to what I've just said, and then uh, you can start your presentation. Please take about 10 to 12 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Mutu, uh, for the very kind invitation to speak. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel. I'm uh, from Singapore. And um, I'm just going to talk about uh, three things today. So one, um, as a retina surgeon, I was actually deployed to the front line. So I was involved in uh, co-leading uh, the development of two uh, digital solutions uh, while um, trying to serve the, um, the COVID-19 patients. And then uh, I'm going to just take a spin back to the AI for ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, some of my financial disclosure. Um, currently serving in uh, two task force in AI in a global settings, one in the uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology, as well as one, as, uh, one at the, um, the START AI, which is uh, led by Professor Lord Aradazi in Imperial College. So, I mean, as we all know, we are severely stuck, uh, struck by COVID-19, as uh, Leah has actually rightly pointed out just now. So, this, uh, what, 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 what impact has that actually incurred to the healthcare setting? It has actually increased the public and staff exposure risk. It has incre uh, it resulted in increased waiting time for the patient in the hospital. It resulted in a delay of the treatment and also because of partially the, the frontline workers like us, uh, I mean, the medical staff like us has been deployed to the frontline. And um, so what's the role of the AI and digital technology? So earlier this year, uh, together with some, some of the Duke faculties, uh, including Dr. Larry Kareen, Victor Zhao, who is also the president of National Academy of Medicine in US and uh, uh, Professor Tian Wong, we have actually uh, published this paper in Nature Medicines and that has also been quoted by US CDC uh, earlier this year. So basically in the paper itself, we've actually summarized what of some of the AI and digital uh, technology ranging from IOTs, big data, AI and blockchain in uh, monitoring, surveillance, and trying to mitigate the risk of uh, both COVID-19 patients as well as the non-COVID-19 patients in a healthcare settings. So basically some of the examples that we have given in the article included the Johns Hopkins COVID-19 dashboard was also awarded the, the invention of the year by the times uh, this year and also the AI for risk modeling as well as the CT imaging for COVID-19 patients. So, I mean, in Singapore, as we all aware, unfortunately, we were struck. The, the cases here has uh, taken a big surge uh, among the migrant workers uh, uh, earlier this year. So we actually have to set up this uh, exhibition, the community isolation facilities uh, using some of the you know, convention centers uh, in Singapore. So, I mean, uh, what, uh, uh, what were some of the clinical unmetnity that we, were, we, we faced uh, uh, back then? It was uh, first is a lack of interoperability between the different digital platforms. We are actually trying to have a very low doctors to patients ratio to monitor some of these patients uh, in the isolation facilities. Some of, uh, many of these workers, in fact, more than 50% of them do not speak English. So hence the language barrier and the illiteracy rate is actually a huge issue. The psychosocial well-being is also another concern for someone, you know, not knowing the languages, not knowing where they're being kept and housed. And so this has uh, resulted in many uh, workers are experiencing some of the psychosocial, uh, you know, the distress. And we also lack uh, the centralized COVID and health registry and also a clinically meaningful AI predictive algorithms as well. So, I mean, I'm just going to talk about Dr. COVID and uh, Tammy robots that we actually deploy in the uh, isolation facilities. So, Dr. COVID is an end to end patient uh, digital solutions that we actually created with seven multilingual audio with uh, audio visual, uh, visual functions to cater for uh, some of the unmet needs that I mentioned just now. Uh, basically, it allows the patient to perform self monitoring of the symptoms, vital signs, as well as the psych psychosocial well being of their, uh, themselves. And we also, uh, because of COVID, uh, Dr. COVID, we are trying to enable a higher patient's throughput in a very manpower constrained environment. So the doctors to patient ratios, we're talking about one to 400. And um, the last thing is to actually see, um, to see how we could potentially keep them entertained during the three to, uh, two to three weeks of the, you know, the isolation period. So um, the second um, the ro um, the second technology that I talked about just now was the Tammy robots, the uh, telepresence robots, and this is uh, uh, about one and a half meters, uh, you know, tall robots that actually move around. The mobility range is about fifty meters. Um, 
And uh, basically what we have done with the tele in uh, isolation facilities, we actually perform the telemedical consultations, telepharmacy consultations, telecounseling uh, consultation, as well as the telemonitoring of the vital signs. And uh, we also uh, use uh, TEMI as a kind of like a policeman to actually uh, go around to actually remind people to, uh, um, to ensure safe uh, distancing measures as well. So these are some of the, uh, the pictures that we actually use uh, TEMI. And uh, as you can uh, see from the top left uh, corner of the presentation, we managed to reduce the dwell time of the, uh, the healthcare worker by uh, 72 hours per month. So as we all aware, we're currently in the fourth industrial revolution. So AI is actually uh, is a uh, is a indispensable uh, you know the um, uh, data analytic tools I would say um, in the healthcare and the non healthcare setting. So I mean AI is nothing new. It's uh, it's been coined back in 1950s, and then the deep learning is a new kids in the block that's been described about 10 years ago. So if you actually talk about deep learning, you cannot actually uh, get away without uh, knowing these uh, three big figures, uh, namely Yosha Benjo, Jeffrey Hinton, as well as Zen Lacoon. So basically, I, I will also encourage the audience to read uh, this landmark paper in nature uh, that has been currently cited uh, uh, for more than 40,000 times, uh, you know, worldwide. Basically, I mean, uh, four years ago when this came out, it shocked the world. So, you know, World Go, Go Best Player has been beaten by AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero again shocked the world the second time. That's, uh, you know, uh, one and a half years later using the deep reinforcement learning. So how is that actually, uh, you know, related to the healthcare um, the, the, the sector. So basically, um, the same uh, technique has been used by uh, Google DeepMind, but now uh, they actually coined a new, uh, new name called the Alpha Fold team um, to actually predict how the protein can fold and unfold. And the first, uh, the, um, the first competition in CAPS 13 has again uh, wowed the world with their uh, superb performance. But having said that, Alpha Fold 2, I'm not sure how many of you actually has read the articles, actually has just been published a few weeks ago. I mean, uh, again, Again, if you can tell, uh, see from the bar chart, I mean, the performance has actually uh, surged from 55% all the way to close to 90%. So if you actually uh, have a score of more than 90%, it is actually can be quite comparable to the experimentally determined structure. So how is this going to change how we actually practice medicine in the future? So if you ask a human to actually manually calculate the protein, it takes 13.8 billion years to do it. And deep learning could potentially expedite the process. And how is that going to relate to what we actually uh, do in medicine? First, it can actually potentially modify how the disease progress. Second, we can potentially uh, develop some of the new gene therapies and the therapeutic targets for new drugs. So we, we, we're potentially talking about a lot of novel winning like a uh, prize uh, medications uh, moving forward. So AI in Medica uh, me medical world has been actually widely adopted in CT uh, imaging for lung cancer, the um, you know cardiovascular, uh, the domains, the skin, and also the breast and uh, you know oncology as well so I mean this again uh, is a work that I had the privilege to review um, so Google has uh, said that if you use deep learning and the big data analytics you can potentially tell the age and the gender of a patient just by looking at the fundus imaging so in fact we validated the AI algorithms using the Singapore data sets in fact we confirmed that the uh, the experiments was true so it was actually published in the Nature Med Biomedical Engineering so I mean together jointly together with the AI experts worldwide in ophthalmology we have published also a few major review articles. And uh, this is some of the Singapore experience in developing AI for retina eye screen using deep learning, as well as a systemic disease screening. So we published in JAMA, Lancet, as well as a, a, a New England Journal of Medicine as well. So, I mean, I uh, just wanted to share, uh, last, this is my last part of my presentation, some of the work that we've done in Singapore for the last uh, five years. So we actually published this in JAMA back in 2017, looking at how deep learning system could, could be used to detect uh, the potentially blinding eye conditions, namely diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, and AMD. So we actually uh, conducted a multi-center AI studies involving different countries, different studies, different races, different retinal cameras, uh, different reference standards as well. So we used VG 19, which was one of the very popular uh, VGG net back then, uh, and close to half a million of uh, the retina images uh, on DR glaucoma suspect AMD. And we actually found that the AI system using deep learning has comparable outcome uh, against the human graders. And as you can tell, the AUC is all uh, within the clinically acceptable range. 
And we have also further validated and tested the AI algorithms using the uh, data sets that we gather from all around the world and it shows consistent performance as well. Right now, for the last two years, we have uh, integrated the uh, AI system um, technically and clinically into the national screening platform. So this is uh, one of the, the reading platform that we have. Right now, we are trying to replace 100% with AI system on the stage one and so that the human can actually focus on some of the abnormal findings uh, that they found from the retinal images by the AI system. So this is uh, the preliminary results that we have. We currently conducted that on uh, more than 13, 000, uh, uh, 12,000 patients. And um, the results so far has been consistent with what we published uh, four years ago. This is just uh, some of the roadmap that uh, I would like to actually uh, illustrate to the audience. And um, the, uh, con um, the performance itself, as uh, I've alluded earlier, is consistent with JAMA. But um, we also looked at how we could combine the human intelligence and the artificial intelligence uh, uh, in uh, detecting the diabetic retinopathy. And as you can see, while retaining the sensitivity, the specificity actually went up. So how is this actually uh, uh, translate into the cost uh, effectiveness? Basically, if you look at the AI system, we're not just talking about what is the diagnostic performance, but we also need to assess from a health economic standpoint. So, I mean, uh, from the study itself, we found that the combination of the human and AI actually yield the best economic model. That actually also surprised us. I mean, because before that, we thought if we actually replace the system with just AI alone, that could actually be very cost effective, but actually the answer is no. So, we actually run the marker modeling, um, and that this is what we found. The semi-automated system actually saved the, uh, the best cost. So, and this uh, has also been listed as a national AI algorithm in Singapore. So these are some of the challenges that I think uh, we are all very aware, including the infrastructure, IT's limited access to data, the explainability, the black box issues, as well as the lack of experience of how people uh, from the academic setting could actually take it to operate, uh, operationalize it in the commercial setting. So, I mean, uh, the patients uh, that has also been further complicated by the public patient's reluctance and the physician reluctance as well prior to the COVID-19 setting. And then now, uh, as the Chinese saying, we are currently in the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. So opportunity always follow the danger. So I think it has actually taken a big turn uh, after this uh, crisis. So patients, physicians, regulators, providers, funders are starting to accept that. And this is my last slide. So I would just like to end my presentation with what Sir Winston Churchill like to say, we should never let a good crisis go to waste. And with this, I would like to thank the organizer for the kind invitation to speak. Thank you so much for keeping uh, on time. And then we'll have next is Adrian. Adrian uh, is coming in from Tokyo, Japan. So he, Adrian, just introduce yourself so I don't start shall you. Okay, uh, thank you so much for, for take, having take, us. Take about 10, 12 minutes and I'll come back on video again when I am when time is done, yeah? Okay, very good. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak. My name is Adrian Sosna and I uh, lead Hackerus Global Activities. I, I really enjoyed the previous uh, talk because it really resonates with quite a few things that, that we're doing. So I, I look forward to a, a fruitful conversation. Uh, let me just see if I can go ahead and share my screen with you. Uh, as I've prepared some slides that is going to help the conversation. Uh, let's see. Okay, so are you able to see my screen? Yes, it's good, good to go. Very good. Um, so let me just start off by talking a little bit about uh, Hackerus as a company, where, where we're coming from and what we're doing. Uh, so Hackerus is a Kyoto headquartered AI startup that is focused on building AI powered medical imaging and in time series analysis uh, tools. Uh, we are what you could call a one-stop solution provider. So this means we work with clients from the stage of data collection all the way into integrating models for use in equipment. Um, we've raised up until a series B round, we're around 70 people today. Uh, we work closely with uh, Kyoto, Tohoku and Shiga University on, on joint research. And we're supplier to, to companies like Ohara Pharmaceutical, Omron, uh, DS Pharma Animal Health, Bayer, uh, ITK Engineering, uh, etc. Um, so what we make is we make a, a platform which we call Salus, which is for both medical and, and life science AI use cases. Uh, what kind of sets uh, uh, Salus apart and, and where I think Salus actually remedies 
uh, some of the concerns that the previous speaker mentioned is, is we provide a platform which is made from human expertise as well as generated data. And we do this using a proprietary AI tool which is based on sparse modeling. What, what that means on, on, a, on a high level is, is that we can provide explainability. So the concerns that, that are in the market for black box usage that often comes with, with AI, meaning you can't understand why the model has made a certain recommendation is, is something we can overcome with this uh, technology. This also means that the, the tool is actually able to uh, recommend uh, different uh, courses of action to the human user and the human user is the one that 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 uses the insights so it really is about a collaborative model between the, the AI as well as the, the, the doctor uh, we can seamlessly integrate the solution with deployed equipment and it's very fast and, and, and resource efficient um, so I wanted to focus in really on the topic at hand and talk a little bit about some lessons we've learned from, from 2020 and some changes we've seen from previous years working in, in this field. And, and I'd like to illustrate that with three examples of projects that we've been able to publicly announce in this year and talk a little bit about the dynamics behind them. Uh, so the first one I'm going to talk about is, is a project that we've been doing together with uh, Mitsubishi Electric, uh, where we're fusing our AI capabilities with their industrial robot arms for automating medical research. Uh, the second one I'm going to be looking at is uh, medical AI imaging, uh, specifically MRI images, for analysis of, of early stage liver cancer that we're doing together with, with Kobe University here in Japan. And the final example is going to be looking at uh, medical AI imaging video based, which is analysis for cervical cancer that we're doing with, with Kyoto University. Uh, so starting from, from the beginning, uh, the first example I'm going to talk about is our work together with uh, Kobe University. And uh, what we're doing here is, is we announced this is in May. So this is really when a lot of uh, regions are starting to, to, to feel the effects of, of, of Corona, but we're still able to, to get started with, with this program. And, and what, what the problem at hand is, is uh, that liver cancer is a growing concern in Japan and in other developed uh, parts of the world. And while there is there's definitely equipment available, there is a, a shortage of specialists that are able to interpret cancer uh, tumor scans in MRI images, right? And, and what we were doing there, or we are doing, is, is, is building a solution that assesses a sequence of T1, V1 uh, uh, images and, and can detect early stage HCCC cancer. We're talking about very small tumors, less than a centimeter uh, in size. And what we're really doing here is we're taking that specialist knowledge that already exists to interpret these scans, and we're creating a digital version of it, and we're bringing that capability to uh, basically any hospital that has has the equipment. Uh, this is work that we've been doing both on site, but but mostly remotely uh, to support this this uh, research project. The next example that I, I wanted to kind of emphasize on is the work we're doing with Kyoto University. This was announced a little bit earlier in the year, in the end of, of, of April. And uh, so cervical cancer is the most common type of a women's health related cancer in Japan. And similarly to the, the liver cancer example, there's a lack of specialists that are able to, to, to look at these and there's a lack of, of equipment which hinders early detection. So what we're building here is, is a tool that actually works with normal video data that's able to detect SIN, which is a, a precancerous stage. Uh, and uh, this is another example of working with a university research center in a remote nature, but still being able to, to make progress and, and moving forward. The last example is, is actually something we announced for Medica uh, Asia or Medical Fair Asia. So it was announced just very recently. And, and what we're doing is, is we're creating an automation solution for cell analysis lab work. And what we're doing is we're integrating Mitsubishi Electric's industrial robot arms with Hakura's medical imaging capabilities. So it's basically a seamless package where the lab robot picks samples for processing, a digital microscope which has uh, Hacker's AI embedded, does the actual lab work, and then classifies the samples for, for next steps. And this has really come out of, of seeing a uh, need for making automated solutions that allow us to continue doing experiments, continue to 
proceed with projects without needing to have uh, humans users to, to the same extent. So in addition to uh, increasing the amount of experiments you can do in a day with this, uh, what it really is about is, is being able to still continue the important work that the medical field is doing while the, the COVID pandemic is, is raging. So I think what in summary, what, what we've seen from our work is, is these changing conditions, this, this shift to, to remote work or even lockdowns have really drawn down into three uh, main changes that, that we can see. The first one is a larger acceptance for the need for uh, remote collaborations. So in a lot of these cases, uh, we are securely transferring data between us and then the client, but we're doing all the work on the hacker side and, and having online meetings and having online reviews. There's less of the need to do things in person. And, and that's really a, a game-changing shift in the ability to handle more projects and be more efficient. So, so I really think that's uh, somewhat a silver lining on, on the current situation. The other part is, is uh, a re-understood uh, need for scaling specialist expertise using digital technologies like, like AI that we're focusing on. So there is so much focus and effort that's being diverted into to COVID that you're, you're missing, you're not focusing enough on the other conditions and you're not doing enough of the proactive research. Whereas uh, by scaling this specialist expertise and bringing it to smaller hospitals, bringing it to, to, to more uh, uh, health uh, providing uh, facilities allows you to really kind of tap into the power of AI for this field. The last part I would say is also about uh, new market entry and, and collaboration. So uh, perhaps you, you wouldn't think of Mitsubishi Electric as a company that, that uh, is, is big in the, the medical field, but, it, but it's definitely entering the field and growing in this space. And it really shows that the power of industrial robotics is really helping with, with the, the field uh, uh, and how it develops. Uh, my, my final slide is, is showing you the overview of the industrial robot and, and hackerous uh, setup. We actually have a, a demo over at our booth here at, at uh, Medical Fair Asia. So I invite you to visit the hackerous booth, check this video out, check the demo out and get a feel for the work that we're doing. If you're interested in learning more about our lightweight and explainable AI, please send me an email to adrian at hackerous.com or visit our websites. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. You kept within 10 minutes. I didn't have to say anything. So fantastic. Uh, last of our spotlight panel member is Ashish. Ashish, can you go on video, please? Oh, he's missing. It's, I think he got locked out or what? He's not there at the moment. Okay, never mind. I think he's dropped out. I can't see him. Okay, let's uh, let's have a conversation and don't worry about uh, his. Uh, if he comes back on, we'll have let him speak for a few minutes. If he doesn't come back on, then we will just not worry so much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you you can among yourselves also ask questions if you like. I have no issues. And we just, while we wait for the ah, uh, Vikash is back. Vikash is coming back. He's back. Let him just connect because she just came back on time. I was just going, you dropped out and you're back. Great. So you have 10 minutes to share your views. And then, I mean, you do a lot of funding and uh, angel investment. So you can maybe take it from that sort of angle, which will help the startups who are present here, typically Leah and Adrian. And I mean, Daniel to a certain extent too, but you can give us your perspective because you've been investing around the world, just not specifically in India. So go for it. Thanks, Metu. Uh, happy to be on this panel and happy to share my thoughts. Of course, you know, like how Mutu has introduced me, I'm uh, I'm basically into investments and, you know, uh, but primarily I'm also, uh, I mean, background, I'm an electronic engineer and I'm more towards, you know, inclined towards the technology. And uh, we started with, you know, doing a lot of R&D research and development and then, you know, moving towards mass manufacturing. That is our, you know, base work and that is our prime, uh, you know, majority of the, uh, investments and uh, the source of income is coming from the manufacturing and research and development. But, uh, you know, six to seven years before we thought that, you know, how long we'll keep on, you know, doing the research on ourselves when the 
research and the papers and the development is ready on the platter through the startups. So we thought of extending our investments to the startups that, you know, thinking that let the startup innovate the things and then we can give them all, all the infrastructure required. So uh, we moved on in investments and uh, in health tech and healthcare and medical industry. We have been doing uh, substantially very well since last two and a half years. And this pandemic has given, uh, of course, you know, on a sad part, we, we know whatever has been suffered by the nation. But on the other side, uh, you know, COVID-19 has really played a catalyst in, in, you know, innovations and bringing new technologies to the world. So uh, definitely I'll be sharing my thoughts more towards, uh, you know, on the investment side that, you know, how and what we are looking out uh, in terms of keeping a topic like a blockchain and AI. Um, I, I would appreciate Dr. Daniel sharing a lot of insights and, you know, I've been not knowing that, you know, these all things is still, you know, uh, going to be implemented. Uh, there was a lot of insights shared by Leah as well. So uh, as far as uh, I understand technology about AI and blockchain, uh, people have more, more towards, you know, better health record exchange and, you know, data security, privacy. So people are moving more towards this, you know, encryption of data, uh, you know, record, record exchange and all. But I'll, I'll just give you some of my thoughts where, uh, where this prospect of blockchain and AI is going to move and which will move towards, uh, 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 you know, bringing it more valuable uh, towards the health tech industry. Uh, I would like to focus on the medical research where the clinical data security is very important. Now people and most of the startups are focusing more on, you know, encrypting and, you know, preserving the, the patient's data. But, you know, when it comes to the medical uh, research, there has been a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, phishing and uh, data leak is happening at the time of, uh, you know, medical research. Uh, when the world is working on such a research where a lot of data exchange is required, there is, there is a lot of clinical data which is also getting exchanged. So blockchain, as we all know that, you know, it is a, a information of blocks and, you know, it is being encrypted and uh, uh, being authenticated only through the end customers. So by, by using such technology, I think, you know, uh, the, the trust in medical research has come across and uh, I could see very less company who are providing such, uh, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure where, you know, the clinical data is being secured other than the governments and, you know, few bigger companies. So, uh, uh, as a as an investor and you know being into the technology field, I would definitely look forward that you know if somebody can even you know extend their uh, you know uh, bandwidth where they are able to you know uh, keep the health records of the patients, they can even extend their bandwidth in you know keeping the clinical re data research in security as well. Uh, of course, you know, uh, medical supply chain and uh, uh, authentication is again one of the use cases which, you know, you, you all have explained. And uh, uh, this is, this is uh, one of the use cases where most of the start startups have adapted to their, um, uh, their portfolio. But extending to that, I'll just again uh, give you one more use case where supply chain is fine. The blockchain is definitely giving a shape to the proper supply chain. But... Uh, I'll just give you an insight that 1% of the total economy and the, you know, the investment which is being done into the supply of uh, uh, supply and management of the medicines is, uh, you know, uh, it is like, you know, the fake medicines. So uh, the fake medicine tracking and uh, the expired medicine taste tracking, that is again, one of the businesses which is being carried out by many other people, like which is spoiling the entire supply chain of medical field. So, using the blockchain and using the AI. I mean, the, there has been a technology which is again, many, very few companies are being uh, working on it where they can track these kind of, uh, you know, false uh, uh, fake medicines where they are not even, you know, securing the economy, but also securing, securing the supply chain of the medicines. So uh, again, uh, as an investor, these, these technologies and, you know, uh, even on, on a healthcare sector, these technologies needs to be adapted uh, and taking it as a concern where it, it can add uh, a lot of value to the health healthcare sector. Um, genomics, yes, which uh, Leah has already you know, stated into her presentation, that is something which is definitely uh, an important factor where, uh, I mean, uh, 20 years before, people used to spend, spend in, in multi-million dollars to just to, you know, go for encrypted database uh, for genomics. But now it has come down substantially to, you know, thousands of dollars. 
uh so there definitely you know the focus can be driven where the dno records you know uh, with an encrypted encrypted database can be uh, provided to the scientists for better uh, you know insights coming out through the uh, genomics part so uh, that is something one of the sector which is going to be grown in a substantial manner even in india people are working a lot into this sector so uh, this is again one of the sector where you know it is fascinating uh one of the startups which where uh, we are working uh, very closely and uh, we are will be you know looking forward for such more startups coming in uh, called as doc ai uh, where the patient shares their medical history into their platform and uh, uh, it is it is a it is a common platform where the doctors and the medicines and the scientists are also you know available there and you know they share their medical history and uh, the uh, the end user uh, pulls up the data they they gives their analysis and then recommendations and the moment it done uh, it is it's completed the the data gets automatically deleted so using the blockchain the patients are feeling themselves secure enough that you know they are sharing their information it is being uh, their requirement is also being you know uh, delivered and at the same time the data is also getting delivered uh, you know deleted from the chain so this is something which is a very innovative platform where i would uh, uh, you know definitely suggest that you know if this can this this thing can be even adapted to your uh, platforms as well and even you know the upcoming startups who can uh, adapt this uh, technology uh, i'll just give you the, the, there was a very good insights which is again reported because uh, you know i'll be in, uh, talking more towards the uh, numbers and the insights towards the investment so i have taken out this uh, uh, particular analysis where it is written that between 30 to 40 cents of every dollar spent on healthcare is spent on the cost of poor quality so this extraordinary number represents slight more than a half a trillion dollar a year a vast amount of money is wasted on overuse or underuse misuse duplication system failures unnecessary repetitions poor communication and inefficiency so these are the main major cause where the blockchain can be a uh, you know Uh, a big replacement where you know this uh, where the healthcare sector the medical sector the economy economy of the healthcare sector can be rectified by you know removing such flaws into the system so uh, definitely from my perspective i would be uh, more than happy to extend uh, you know uh, more cooperation from the investment domain part and uh, you know exchange more and more uh, uh, information where where the the sector is going uh, ahead and where the investment is you know looking forward and what value uh, you as a startups or you know you uh, bringing more and more innovations can be brought in where you know uh, of course the the investment and the innovations are uh, synergizes to a common platform and uh, we definitely look forward for uh, for uh, a better innovations coming in into this sector using this technology okay thank you so much we have finished much quicker than uh, expected no worries so let's now see whether there's any questions in the board there is one someone has asked a question a anyone can answer this could covid 19 help refine ai and blockchain technology in the field of healthcare in anyone can answer I, i think the the short answer is probably yes <laughs> I, i think we'll probably all agree on that but uh my my uh perspective perhaps would would be that it's probably going to accelerate the process that's already started in terms of finding the right uh, use cases that there's so many things that you can do that, that there's an entire world of of things that we can do with these technologies in this field but i think that this is forcing us to go after the most immediate problems that need the quickest fixing and and where sort of the low hanging fruit is so uh, from from the hackers perspective that's meant a lot of medical uh, imaging analysis work and building solutions that push that field forward with with ai but i can imagine as as i heard from other presenters in, in with regards to uh blockchain usage that that can be a lot about patient uh, data security which which mm -hmm. is also put forward so uh, those are my uh, two cents or 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 what have you okay yeah i'll just uh, uh just add to that please 
that's okay. Um, because I've seen quite um, significant changes happen occurring during this time because I've followed it quite closely. And I've seen a lot of projects happening. So in this space, particularly around the blockchain projects uh, to strengthen up supply chains. So I, I briefly men mentioned the $50 million in the US that's passed. And I guess what was happening prior to COVID was that there was a slow adoption of this technology. And this is what I was witnessing in the, even in the 2019, a very slow adoption. So this year I've seen probably about three or four projects go ahead from a government level. So where we've been trying to do the um, bottom up approach, there's been now a top, so a top down approach where governments have uh, now, you know, endorsed this, but it brings other challenges ahead. So things like, you know, to use a permissionless or permission blockchain, you know, do you go for, um, also, the challenges around the immutability of data, so storing health data in the uh, off-chain private key. So there are other challenges we've had to now really face and find solutions for. So uh, where I think that there is an adoption, we're all still, I wouldn't say trialling, because I think it's very established that this is the way forward, but we we still have a bit of time to, we, we still have some time to really understand it, how this um, technology, particularly in healthcare, is going to work across the, across the board. And that's why we're experimenting um, with the different use cases. And I really like um, Vikash's comments on that around the, the clinical trials data and research as well, because we've chosen to go for a couple of the use cases, but we have to collaborate with people that are doing, for example, clinical trials, because it's how to best access uh, patient information for those clinical trials, but also turning the model a bit on its head where if uh, traditionally, you know, when companies were collecting health data through pharmaceutical companies, um, deploying things like apps or, or solutions, they would gain access to this data. What this means into the future by patients own, owning their own health data and securing that data mm -hmm. is that they can potentially be incentivized for this data in the future as well. So it's a different way to look at the model um, around healthcare is how healthcare is working at the moment. So, yeah, I, I quite like the points that were raised. Hey, in the Danny and Vikash, you can quickly have some more questions. I want to take them before we call time. So, if you want to add anything, please quickly. If not, I'll take the next question. Yeah, I'll take the next question. Next question is How do you deal with the blockchain technology for public surveillance systems during COVID pandemic? Anyone wants to take that? Is uh, public surveillance talking about contact tracing? I imagine. I guess what they're talking about, how would yeah. you yeah, yes. change to protect this? Yeah, so um, there was a, a COVID track um, used in, in Singapore, and I think they did a survey on that to see uh, the confidence that people had in the, the contact tracing system. And I think about the survey indicated about 57% of people were not confident that their data wasn't collected and used. So there is still uh, there is, is still concern around these contact tracing apps, and it, it's brought up a lot of discussions. There's companies like Zcash that are, uh, are blockchain companies that are looking at advanced cryptography. Uh, around how how this data is stored, so I think that there is that it has brought to to um to light public surveillance. And I'm working on a group called Ethical and um, Responsible AI at the moment, and we're really looking at focusing on how this data is being used for contact tracing and public surveillance. Great. Anyone would like to add on to that? Uh, Daniel, from yeah, yeah, from a medical point of view, anything you think they can do on that? I think like the, uh, I agree with what Leah said. I mean, like the, the responsible AI and uh, the AI ethics, I think this is something that's, that's uh, in, a, in a machine learning and a deep learning community, we are actually, uh, you know, um, we've been discussing it very, um, uh, this, is, this is like a hot discussions in the field right now. And especially with all the, you know, the COVID contact uh, tracing. And uh, so like the, 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 uh, the app that Leah has actually just uh, mentioned is uh, something what we call, Trace together in Singapore, but I mean, <laughs> even prior to this, like I mean, in Israel and things. I'm not sure how how many of you have heard of uh, some something called Big Brother, 
um, the the phenomenon. Um, so th those are the one of the the few things that the, um, in, at the national level they are actually tracking every single patient's uh, you know the data. So I mean there's no different from how China is actually tracking every single one mm -hmm. from WeChat and stuff. So I think the the problem is already existing. So I, I think it's just a cultural sensitivities that we have to take into account. Uh, you know I mean. Uh, coming from say um, uh, China versus UK, US, you know something that you do in China, you, you, you please rest assured that every single day there's people protesting outside your door uh, in UK, US, and whatnot, right? So I mean those are the things that I think when we do AI, it needs to be a very personalized, very individualized, um, you know. Um, uh, it needs to, uh, I mean, the individualized and the personalized approach has to be taken uh, care for. And then um, there's a there's also another thing. Uh, on the AI, whether it would actually help refine that, I, I think it will because, I mean, as I showed in the last few slides, I think the funders, I think the ecosystem generally are more uh, receptive to, uh, you know, the AI and the tech use, uh, especially during this period of time. Not because some some people are just forced to be, uh, you know, to accept that because it's just that, I mean, uh, in a lockdown setting, you just have no other better way to do it. But once you start getting things uh, going, and so, oh, actually, it's not that bad, you know, for the things that you've been like uh, hating for the last 10 years. But once you use it for a few months, actually, it's like, oh, yeah, it's actually not that bad. Every single one is using their mobile phones, you know, uh, uh, scanning the QR codes, going here and there to restaurants and whatnot. I think this, uh, this, this pandemic crisis has really changed, uh, turned the world around and has really, you know, uh, take the digital technology to the next level, whether it's AI, blockchain, IOTs and whatnot. I think... Yeah, I think we are talking about the brand, a uh, whole new level. I mean, moving uh, in the next, uh, ne next one decade at least. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, interest of time, I've got one more question. I really want to take it. Uh, someone has posted, when we are done with COVID, do you think AI in health will move up even faster or end up slowing down? Obviously, technology has been speeding up thing, speed, sped up things over the last one year. But the question is, I think a very good question. Do you think AI is being just so much now and people will forget about it afterwards? I'll just uh, expand on my previous point very quickly uh, so that I can still uh, allow other, uh, you know, the uh, panelists to actually uh, add on. I mean, uh, just uh, leveraging on what I just said, I, I think it would actually speed up the process. And then because uh, a lot of the rules has been made, uh, you know, especially for uh, the COVID uh, crisis, but also because of that, I think they actually streamline a lot of the different processes that like people, um, I mean, one of the, I mean, the AI stuff that we're doing, we were actually one of the first groups uh, doing it in Singapore. So there's a lots of things that unknown things from even from a regulator standpoint that they don't they don't actually know how to handle it. So I think uh, you know with all a lot of the technologies coming into the space, I think that 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 would really help like speed up a lot of the you know the adoption. Yeah. There's no hurry. I've just got a message from the man, uh, from the program manager. The conversation is so exciting. We can spend an extra few minutes. She's given me permission. So we are doing good. We're doing good. So anyone wants to add to that, please add to that before I throw the next uh, spanner into the works. So I, I just jump in and, and say, I think that it's a matter of perspective. So either we see adoption of AI technologies in this field as something entirely new that hasn't had anything to do with the field in the past, or we see it as a, a continual evolution just about how we are able to provide care and how we're able to, to, to treat various uh, diseases and conditions. Because really what we're talking about is just another leap in tools that allow us to provide better care. It's, it's not a question of something very foreign that came in and said then it's going out. It's rather just a continuous path of providing better and better solutions. And, and if you look at it like that, I think this is, 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 a, is, is something that's going to continue over time, become more and more commonplace. Anyone else want to add anything before I throw the next question in? Since we are connected to the you know technology pool and innovation pool, we know that you know there has been a substantial acceleration into this uh, you know uh, AI adoption of AI and blockchain into the health tech industry. So definitely, uh, whether the COVID uh, you know remains or it goes, the way people have picked up this opportunity and as I said, you know better term, you know it it has you know acted as a catalyst. People have. Uh, known that you know what more can be done in the healthcare industry using these technologies and I think you know this is going to open doors a lot of uh, uh, new uh, you know uh, prospects to to the healthcare industries 
Okay, now, uh, question, since this is a startup podium, we have a lot of startups listening to us, we want to address their concern. Now, from the investment point of view, do you think there's a lot of investment going in this area or is it just a hit? So that depends, uh, Mutu, uh, that depends what is your preference all about. Uh, but yes, if, we, uh, if I compare uh, to uh, two years before or one and a half years before, uh, the kind of investment which was being parked for the healthcare industry was selective by the uh, by the investors. And uh, me talking about like, you know, we are a corporate fund, we are uh, not a VC. So, you know, more we, uh, we have looked this as an opportunity where, you know, we can add it to our conglomerate where, you know, uh, this is the highest scalable uh, growth sector. So, but if I'm comparing uh, as a common investments and uh, uh, the investment which used to be done a couple of years before. Yes, there has been uh, a surge of at least 30 to 40% towards the healthcare sector. Oh, great. And da Daniel, to, leading on to that question, being a practitioner in the medical line, healthcare provider in the front line, do you think doctors are now starting to be more uh, accustomed, willing to accept things like AI and technology and so on? Yeah, I, I certainly, uh, uh, I, I think they do. Um, and um, in fact, uh, you know, I am, I'm pretty sure a lot of the hospital systems is undergoing a massive digital transformations, uh, leveraging on uh, virtual plat platforms to perform video consultations with patients and, you know, sending uh, the medication to the patient's home, leveraging on the blockchain technology, you know, the supply chain, making sure that the, the, the right medication has been made from the right company, sent to the right patients, you know, those, those are the, uh, some of the very, uh, you know, the good examples, how te technology has really uh, you know, help the uh, not uh, help the patients. Uh, in fact, to really and and also the physicians to um to to uh, kind of uh, push uh, some of the, the the care forward. Because otherwise, I mean, everyone would just uh, come to a standstill. Kind of uh, and, and it's not very good from a patient's perspective. So yeah, doctors, uh, a lot of the especially the elderly ones, because I, I, we feel that the younger generation have no problem at all. But it's just a, most of the one that are res, uh, who are resistant to the, the adoption usually comes from the, uh, the you know the, the the slightly more elderly populations yeah if i could actually put it in a very diplomatic manner yeah <laughs> very nicely said now the two startups are there uh, two technology companies now you've heard the vc perspective or the investment perspective will not say vc investment perspective it's good the user says yes so what do you guys think startups listening today to us should be looking at and how could they maximize during this this uh, pandemic and also afterwards. May Leah, can, Leah, please go first. So, um, sorry, Mutu, just to get that question again, what can startups maximize for our- uh, What should they focus on? What sort of what okay. area do you think? Yeah, From sure, I guess- Sure, sure. Uh, I guess for me, um, what what I've seen probably the last year is, um, well, two years probably that I've been in the game, is uh, just the amount of startups that have come up, sprung up in the space, um, doing similar type of things to to what you're doing. I guess what what it is is how you differentiate yourself from the rest, and that that's been the biggest thing for us to to really see what the offering is that we're given. Um, just reflecting on some of Daniel's points as well. You know, you really have to, there, there is an adoption within healthcare providers and, and hospitals to, to transform, but some countries are moving very quick in that, quickly in that space. Other countries are lagging behind. So this is about how you try to get this type of universal healthcare, you know, where, where well, in countries like get healthcare, equality in healthcare as well. So we're really focusing on how we look at different parts of the world you know Singapore's very rapid adoption and so on but then I'm working with other countries like Venezuela and Mexico and you really we've got problems there with getting uh, medications out getting access to healthcare treatments and I really believe that technology has has a part in that so as a startup it's just not looking at one one slice of the, the, the pie like look at look at all of it across the board and see how we can bring it solutions across the board to get um, more unified standards and I think that's the big thing that's come out of um, COVID-19 is that it's not one country it's the world so so we really need to, to look at that and how we address that. Adrian? 
Yeah, so so I, I think the, it's it's difficult to to disagree. I think we're we're all kind of uh, on the same page. But I I'd say uh, start by identifying a problem and figure out if that problem is worth solving. Is there patience? Is there market? Is there interest enough to kind of fund the development? Because if you start in the technology end, you may end up with something that's technically very elegant but not really aligned with, with market needs or expectations. So starting by qualifying the, the problem that you're trying to solve and, and then work your way back to build a solution that, that, that is targeted to that problem is, is really a good way to do this. And there's so many potential usage that have sprung out of, of, of the, this, this uh, uh, corona situation. Something we haven't talked about so much here would be uh, mental health uh, application related things that you can do as a huge field. And I've seen some work in this regards, but it's, it's, it's really impressive all the new ideas that people come up with. Um, so start with the problem and, and then build your solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vikash, your last uh, words, comments for people listening out there. Yeah, on mute. That's the first time I had to say it on the seminar. In the last 10 days, I've said plenty of that. We are on mute. Go for it. So to conclude this, uh, I believe that, you know, uh, yeah, a lot many opportunities are, you know, piling up. Uh, I would uh, suggest that, you know, uh, the examples which I've given, like Doc AI and, uh, you know, the clinical data security and all, if at all people can focus using this technology because, you know, this forum is based on blockchain and AI. So, uh, definitely uh, using this technology, there could be a lot of prospect which can come up and, you know, can be added to the health tech system, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, the other panelists has added. That is something which is very important. Um, as far as uh, investment is concerned, as I said, you know, there has been a surge and definitely you can take it as an opportunity. We are also looking for some innovations where, you know, we can definitely park our funds and, uh, you know, contribute to the healthcare system. Fantastic. Adrian, your last comments. I'd say uh, thank you uh, for hosting this this panel. It's been a very interesting conversation, and uh, it's really encouraging to see how many different parts of the world are, are moving forward with this type of technologies and, and really trying to remedy this situation. So again, thank you for for inviting us to be here, and I really enjoy the conversation. Great, thank you for being here, Daniel. We would have been in Singapore if not for COVID, and we would have all met. No, yeah. I, in fact, we have another platform. Uh, we, another uh, uh, seminar concurrently talking about how we should distribute vaccines. Uh, you know, the COVID nineteen vaccines in Singapore. Yeah. So I think this is uh, something that is going to happen uh, in the next uh, couple of months uh, around the world. So yeah, I mean, uh, sad that uh, you know the conference can't be held in Singapore. Uh, otherwise, we could have met each other. You know, face to face. Uh, you know, I'll take you guys out for a beer. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, yeah, hopefully we can actually stay connected, uh, you know, through, through LinkedIn or some uh, digital Absolutely. platform. Yeah, really hope to see you guys soon. Great. Leah, as the only lady in the panel, you can have the last <laughs> yeah. word. So, yeah, thanks, Muchi, for inviting me here. It's been so interesting, all the talks. So I really appreciate, like, every time I come on here, I worked in clinical pharmacy healthcare for... Um, eight or nine years and like to see the developments on each of the companies are doing it's it's incredible so I really appreciate the time that I've spent with everyone so thank you okay I told a lie so I have the last word as the closing panel so thank you so much Leah thank you Adrian Daniel and Vikash hopefully as Daniel said we'll all get, get a chai coffee or beer whenever we meet soon. So take care and thank you so much. And thank you to the background, the, the people behind there, Daphne and her team. Thank you guys. See you soon. Take care.